Welcome everyone to our Future Voices event for the month of March 2021. Um, first, I would like to just recognize, um, take a moment and recognize uh, all those we've lost over the past two weeks in the um, Atlanta shooting and in the shooting a uh, couple of days ago in Boulder um, and recognize their sacrifices in their lives as well. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day. He is Mr. Ebenezer Norman, um, an amazing philanthropist and personal friend of mine. He is a Liberian-born American philanthropist, children's advocate, and founder and director of New Dimension of Hope. Mr. Norman has served as a leader for various organizations, including the Father's Project, and he was recently elected the Global Goodwill Ambassador. In 2013, he was a nominee of the World of Children Award. His passion and commitment to change the world is what drives Mr. Norman every single day. And I have the pleasure of knowing him as a friend for over 20 years. Um, and I've seen his organization grow from just an idea to building schools um, in Africa. I would like, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome him today so that he can impact, impart us with knowledge, passion, um, and the optimism which, which drives him in his mission. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Norman. Ooh. Well, hello, my, my name is Ebenezer Norman, and everyone calls me Norman, you know. Um, I don't like to be called Ebenezer, it's a weird name. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about, um, about hope, you know, optimism, you know, about the future. Uh, we all know that um, for every 10 seconds, a child dies for hunger. 60% of those that are hungry are women. For every second, two persons die from the disease. Um, two days ago, we saw that someone went at the grocery store and killed 10 people. There are a lot of chaos around us. Um, coronavirus killed a lot of people. You guys in the nursing field. So when you see all of that, you start to ask yourself, Where's the hope? Where do we gain our strength? Well, I would like to tell you guys my own little story. I grew up in West Africa, Liberia. And as a little boy growing up, there are lots of things that were around me that really didn't make sense. For example, I had no idea why I was born black. It, it always seems to, to bother me when I when I would put um, the TV on and I would watch the kids on TV and watch myself, this didn't happen to me. And for, and for many years, I, I used to wonder why, why wasn't I born in Sweden or Luxembourg or, or, or North Dakota? Why did I show up as a little black boy in one of the poorest countries in the world? And as a little boy growing up, I would go to my auntie and my uncles and try to seek some logical explanation. But no one would give me no. something tangible. So as a little boy growing up, at the time, I concluded that maybe there was a previous life. And maybe in that previous life, I was such a horrible person. And maybe this, this spiritual being, you know, no. um, just said that, hey, you know, because of your previous life, you're so horrible, I'm gonna punish you, I'm gonna make you black, and gonna put you in one of the poorest countries in the world. Kind of like a punishment. So I grew up believing that. So when I moved here um, in college, my first school year in college, I was looking for something that could help me understand those childhood questions. Where in the world did I come from? And why wasn't I born in Saudi Arabia? Why Liberia, you know? And so I tried philosophy, it didn't work. I tried religion, it didn't work. And so what I found myself doing, I found myself reading a lot. And I would spend a lot of time in my school library 
And something wonderful happened when I started to read. I came across a woman called Susan B. Anthony. She helped led the women movement in this country. I came across a guy called Nelson Mandela. He spent 27 years fighting for the cause. I came across a guy called Dr. King. He was a civil rights leader in this country. I came across another guy called Gandhi. But then I started to realize and notice something. Each of these people came from different parts of the world. You know, they were, in fact, they were different races. Gandhi was Indian, Nelson Mandela was African, Susan B. Anthony was white, Dr. King was African American, and they, they, you know, they spoke different languages. You know, Gandhi spoke Hindu, um, Nelson Mandela spoke Swahili. It, it, but one thing I saw between all of them is that each of them had one thing in common. Each of them was willing to lay down their lives to make the world a better place. And that movement, the light bulb went off in my head. And I said to myself, hmm, why if, why if I was born where I was born for a bigger purpose, right? Why if I was born for a bigger purpose? And I said to myself, hmm, maybe there's something there. To make a long story short, um, I, from that moment, I was very intentional about my life. And I said to myself, the only reason I'm here is because somebody like Dr. King stood up. And because he stood up, a few other people stood up. And look at me. I bail off than most of the people I grew up with, right? So I said to myself, I'll go back and I will give back. For the last, what, 10 years, um, I have built two schools. I changed the lives of over 10,000 plus people. And the reason why I think that this is important for you guys to hear is that I really believe that that being hopeful starts with us. We have to believe that each of us, we are here for a reason. You know, um, whether it's building schools as well as in the healthcare, but that's giving me hope because if you think about a few guys like Dr. King and Susan B. Anthony, those guys were able to shape history so much that the entire world know who they are. So think about it, if four or five people can do so much, what about you and I? So I really believe that I'm so hopeful because my next goal is to create jobs. But think about it, if I was born anywhere else, I wouldn't have been the same guy. I would have been a whole different guy, you know? I also invited one of my, my friends, Senska, to share her story as well, you know? I, I met her a couple of, um, um, months ago, and I like who she are, I like what she's doing, and I maybe I thought that it was a good idea to follow to share her story. But I want to encourage you guys before I give her the mark is that 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 we all here for a reason, and optimism and being hopeful start with us. We have to believe that a little girl that was born in Colorado, a little boy that was born in Colorado, has what it takes to change the world. We have made so much advancement in technology, right? I mean, we can, you can pick up your phone right now and you can see what's happening in South Korea. You can look at your phone right now and you can see, I mean, you can, you, you guys in the nursing field, when women go, I want to pregnant, they go to um, the, 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 the hospital. I mean, you can see the sex of the baby. But in the same world we live in, every 10 seconds, one child dies from hunger. But we can change that. But the way we change that, we have to believe. We have to be hopeful. So I will turn it on to Sam Scott. Yeah. Thank you, Norman. Um, that was so inspiring. And it was so interesting that you, you talk about hope because you and I, we didn't work, you know, you, you did your and I did mine. And it's interesting to see how we both is going to talk about hope. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Sam Scott, and I'm going to talk about my, I'm going to tell you my story. Um, so I was born and raised in Haiti, and growing up in Haiti, it was hard to see how women were treated in this country. Um, you know, as as a young girl, it was I was told that I have to be cleaning, I have to do this, and it it was literally like gender role, like strictly gender roles in Haiti, and I I didn't find it fair. 
um, at 19 years old, I'm, I, I, I got a, a scholarship and I went to Costa Rica to get a degree. I got, I was really happy to experience a different culture, um, meeting people from different parts of the world. It was, it was mind blowing for me and I was really very happy. Um, I had a great time at the university. It was hard to learn Spanish um, and take my classes in Spanish and I had to do my exam in Spanish. Um, it was really hard, but you know what, I, I did it. But while it was such a great experience in my life, I experienced something that was really, really dark in my life also. Um, while I was in Costa Rica in sophomore year, um, I was sexually assault, uh, assaulted. And it was really hard, um, you know, being away from your parents, being in a different culture, um, dealing with everything I was dealing, it was a dark time in my life. But let me tell you, I graduated, I got my license, I'm in agriculture engineering, and it was awesome. And I'm, I'm happy and proud. Um, well, I ended up being in Colorado, I ended up being in Colorado, and um, being in Colorado, I met a girl named Estina Kajigo. And when I met this girl, it was, um, the friendship grew really, really quickly, because I could relate to her as being a woman, being a black woman, growing up in a house where the man treated some type of way that you do not agree with. Um, meeting Essie was like one of my greatest blessings, because Essie um, taught me that um, it's not right what is going on, let's do something about it. But me, I was just like, what can I do about it? I don't think I can do anything about it. I started learning that Essie was the ambassador of women and girls in Uganda, that she's done a lot of work in, in, in Uganda. Um, at 17 years old, she donated her scholarship to open a health center for um, young girls and women that are being abused um, in Uganda. Um, and she, her, her inspiration was her mom, um, seeing all of these things. And she, at, I think at 20, she um, owned started working with refugees, women, and the BDBD settlement, the third largest world in the world. Um, she studied shows about teenage pregnancy, child marriages. Um, she did so much, and I was just like, what am I doing? Jesus. But okay, I'm going to continue with my career. That's what I studied. I can't do anything about it. Um, Essie being in, 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 in the United States, she found love. And then two months later, let me tell you something. A tragic accident happened, and Essie passed away. So it was one of the darkest time of my life. Um, it was hard to see like such a great friend, someone who inspired me to just pass away like this. And I was asking, what about those girls out there? Who are going to continue them, uh, helping them? What are we going to do? And you know, it was like, I, I met Norman and I started telling Norman what I wanted to do and how much I wanted to help women out there and continue her work. Um, and I started a nonprofit. Um, we are helping a lot of women in Uganda. And, you know, this thing that I experienced with Essie really, really made me believe that hope is one of the greatest, like, gifts that we have. Because um, one of the things I was asking myself was, am I going to see Essie again? Oh, my gosh, the hope, like, it's gone. I will never be able to have hope. I will be able to see her again, hug her again, talk about everything that I would love to talk about. Um, and I said, what about those women in Uganda, too? They don't have hope. Who is going to take over? No one else. Essie's parents, they don't know how to read. Um, who is going to take over? And I used this time in my life that was really, really dark and turned into something positive. And that's why I believe that hope is something positive that we need to be taking out there in the world and then bring it to people. A lot of people out there, they need these little lights that we have. We complained, me, we, we moved into this house and I was, to, I was just like, I'm not going to be able to spend like five days without internet. Well, let me tell you something. There are people out there that are going to spend many days without being able to have hope. When are they going to get their next meal? There are women out there that are saying like, how am I going to get out of this relationship? I can't work. I can't do anything of myself. This man is supporting me. And they are being abused and they have only one option. And I do believe that our generation has like this trust where we have technology. We can Google and figure stuff out and help people out there. We don't have to be close to be helping people. From far away, you can help people. Um, and I'm excited about my trip in Uganda, where I'm going to meet all of these people that are helping Essie. Um, with this nonprofit, there were 48 women. They have kids. They are taking care of the house. They don't have a man, and, and they're left to be helping them going forward. And, you know, they, they, they were just stuck and they received a scholarship from Essie. But because Essie passed away last year, 
um, they didn't have money to pay their national exam. What we did in this nonprofit was just contacting people. Let's help these people to sit and pay, you know, pay their fee for the national exam. And now they are going to college next year. Let's, this is hope you are giving these people. You're telling them they are capable because those women, they think they are not worth more than being a mom, than being a, like abusive man, abused woman. And, and I do think like hope, Positivism, it's something that is, positivity is something that is really, really important in this world. And, and, and I think we all can do something together by putting our hands and in, in mind together and help the world out there. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, and since God for that, you know, I'm going to, um, to pick up from yet. Um, I, I like to, when I, when I have these meetings, I like to leave you guys with, a, with some of my favorite story. Um, I, I read a story about, about a girl um, um, in Texas. She, she lives in a place called Houston, and she, she committed a serious crime. And when she went to court, the, the judge said to her, because of the crime you committed, you're going to jail for life. And she was very angry, very upset, you know, um, because she thought that the crime she committed was a mistake. Um, and the judge said, well, you're going to jail for life. You would never, ever see the daylight anymore. And so she was angry um, when, she, when she was on her way to prison. Uh, before she left the, the courthouse, she told the judge, that I'm going I'm to go to jail. I'm going to break prison. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to harm you. And the judge said, whatever, take her from here. Long story short, she goes to prison. But before reaching the prison gates, she meet this old guy. She see this old guy. What he does when someone dies in prison that don't have family, he buries them at his job. She said, oh, kid, I have a perfect idea. She goes to prison. She looked for this old guy and they became friends for a couple of years. So one day, this old guy got sick. He had no money to go to the hospital. She comes to the old guy and says, hey, I have all the money you need, but get me all of it. And the old guy said, how do you suggest I get you all of it? We're in the prison. She said, I have a perfect plan. He said, let me, he said, let me hear it. She said, look, when someone dies, I will slip in the casket and you put the dead body over me and you push the casket beyond the prison wall, you buries me in 24 hours, you dig me up, and we both escape. The old guy said, well, that sounds like a plan. Anyway, someone dies, she slept in the casket, the body went over her, and, and according to the story, she could feel the casket moving. And for the first time in many years, she began to have hope hope that she would see the daylight again, hope that her plan to go and, and kill the judge, hope that she would be able to see her family again. Anyway, she got, she got buried six feet, and she's so happy, she's so optimistic. And the old guy was supposed to come back in 24 hours, but in 24 hours, he did not show up. And she said, hmm, what's going on? We have a plan. He's supposed to be here in 24 hours. But she's very hopeful. She said, well, he will be here the next day. The next day, he didn't show up. She said, wow, what's going on here? You know, like, we had a plan, you know, like, is he gonna disappoint me? But being she was an internal optimist, so hopeful, she said, I'm pretty sure he will be back with that day. The third day, he didn't show up. And for the first time in three days, she began to worry. She said, wow. But when she said, hold on, let me see who died. And when she looked, it was the old guy who died. Now, I think the moral of that story is that sometimes, sometimes we die with our hope. Sometimes we have something in us that we want to do, but we don't do it. And we die with it. This old guy was her only hope, and she died with our hope. And I'm asking you guys today, I mean, like you guys in nice and schools, you guys can be champion of the world. Don't die with your hope. Go out there and change the world. 
that's my little message to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Norman. Thank you, Senska. Very inspirational. Thank you both for sharing your stories. Thank you for the motivation and thank you for the little lesson at the end there, Mr. Norman. Um, Omera, do we have any questions in the chat box or anyone text you with questions? We don't have any questions right now. But I would like to open up the floor to anyone that would like to ask Mr. Norman or Senska a question. Feel free to unmute and ask. And, and I also want to ask something that uh, um, I'm going to start working with Sawa and she's going to help me build a clinic in the village with 5,000 people where there is no hospital, you know, and I'm so excited for that because that would create so much hope in our, in our era. So I'm looking forward to that, Sawa. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. And I think I share that with a couple of the members from Future Voices. Um, last semester in my business, in the business class I was taking, they had us do a business plan and that was part of my business plan. So I'm, I'm going to share that with Mr. Norman. Since he's already established, he works with Rosario Dawson and a few other names I'll throw out there. Um, really uh, prominent people that are passionate about healthcare and education and they really help uh, catapult his organization um, and give them the foundation that they need to make an impact in West Africa. And hopefully now with Senska in East Africa, the goal will be to, like he said, spread this to as many countries as we can and help impact the world in a, in a more um, effective uh, but comprehensive way so that we can reach more people and touch many, many more lives. So I'm looking forward to working with you and hopefully, um, I can elicit the help of members of Future Voices who want to join this organization and make an impact in the lives of people. Uh, just email me or text me if you are interested in joining uh, the new dimension of hope in building clinics and building schools around the world. Thank you, Mr. Norman. I do wanna say something is that um, when we are looking at the world, normally the problem that we see is education and health. Um, and not like me growing up in Haiti and every time I go back to Haiti, I'm not going to lie. I feel guilty. And my therapist says it's survival mode that makes me feel that way. Um, survival guilt. So hearing, you know, Norman working all of these things, like inspire me more and more to do more out there. You know, um, we want to build school too. We want to do, um, we are reopening the health center of SE on April 16th. And all of these things are great stuff that people are looking forward to. And if you just want, you don't, you, you want to go, you want to do anything. It's just like the little act that you make. Sometimes a little text speak louder than anything else. Like even money, like a little text, just some hope to give into someone. It's, it's way more than anything. So someone texted me a question. They said, on a day when a trauma happens, how do you balance the grief with hope? Where do you find the energy for hope? And, and, I, and I take it back to my story, right? A little boy growing up in one of the poorest places in the world that, that believed that he was born because he was born black in one of the poorest countries in the world because somehow he was punished. You know, he did something wrong in in the previous life. Um, and, and it comes to us individually, you know, we have to find the good in everything, even during death. There's a lesson in everything to learn, you know, and we have to find a way to encourage ourselves, you know, and reach out to friends and family who, who positive because it's easy to be down during this time. But think about it. Just think about Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, right? Think about Susan B. Anthony, what helped women to vote. If all these people were being very pessimistic and holding down to depression, the world would be a worse place. But they found a way to have strength and keep going. And we can join from these people's story, right? We can learn from, from the Mandela's and the, the Kings and the, and the Gandhi's because they were just few people. But somehow they were able to overcome all the adversity. So I say, you know, 
draw to a story, reach other friends and family. But you as a person have to believe that somehow, somehow it's going to turn up to something better. Better. I look at my own story. So. I would like to um, touch bit on the grief part. Um, you know, um, after losing my best friend, and I can say this was my first best friend because it's, it's, it's how much she's teaching me about myself and what is out there in the world. Um, and what I did with my grief at the beginning was just like depression. And I'm like, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't think I will ever be able to let someone in into my life again and be my friend and then something happened to you and you're gone again. And I'm going to go through the same pain. And I was dwelling on it. But what I did was, okay, what I've been doing, I didn't, and, and I didn't, I'm just losing my time, wasting my time right here, just crying and do nothing about it. Um, and Essie has a mom, you know, that was waiting for her to come back. There is so many things that was just going into my mind. This is some responsibility I feel toward my friend. And it was literally dragging me down to depression and I was going down. What I did was turning this depression into something positive. Okay. What can I do? I can't return Essie, you know, I can't have Essie back. I can't, you know, really like remove the mom from the situation she's in. But who is out there I can really help? The mom, yes, I can help her economically in some type of ways, but I can't give her daughter back. What can I do for the people that are like, what are we going to do? The health center is closed. Who's going to help us when we are stuck? Who's going to help us like, you know, um, like little kids that are being, you know, married off by um, their 12, 13 years old, married off by, you know, to 40 years old uh, that already have multiple women. And those people are um, desperate. What, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to give hope to society. I'm going to help society to go back to normal. I'm going to feel them. I can reassure them. I can help them some kind of way to move forward. And I use that and give back to the community. And now the people know they're going to have a health center reopening soon. We are going to go back with the planning of like giving them scholarship. We'll we are already making them feeling hopeful. It's, you know, you are grieving, feel every feelings, feel every feelings and recognizing every feelings will help you find a way to move forward. So we have a comment from Amuda um, in the chat. I'm not sure if you see it. She said, very great initiative. Access to healthcare in Liberia, especially rural Liberia, is a major concern. I personally believe that decentralization policy faces serious challenges, not least of which is the difficulty of finding professional health workers willing to deploy to far-flung rural areas. Your initiative is hope. Thank you, that's a good comment. So I have another question here. They said, how do you motivate others to join in on your initiatives and also inspire hope with them? Well, for me, it's just um, I'm living a life by example, you know. Um, most people uh, look at my life and and sometimes they see me with uh, with the Rosario dogs and all these people, and they don't understand um, what it took me to get there. You know, um, most people drive drive less than um, twenty thousand miles a year. Well, in two thousand eighteen, I drove over a hundred thousand um, in one year. I drove Uber and Lyft. I drove Uber and Lyft to finish my school. Uh, because I really believe in it, and most nonprofit, most most nonprofit will go for grants, and and um, it'll go for grants, and 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 they'll do big fundraiser, you know. Uh, but when you when you the dream barrier, and you believe in something, you have to be able to show to people that you actually believe it. And so in 2018, I drove over 100,000 miles. I pick up over 10,000 people, but we were able to successfully build a school for 600 children. 600 children are not in school because I use my story, I use my perseverance to be able to, to keep going. And I think that I, the more I share my story, but most importantly, I tell people that we are special. 
we all special. We all got something that make us special. I tell people, we all have this one thing that make us special. Find your one thing. Maybe your one thing is nice. Maybe mine is building schools. But whatever it is that led you to, you know, that on your heart, go ahead and do it, you know? Don't die with your hope, you know? That's how I do it, you know? Leave by example and just keep telling that, you know, that you, you have what it takes. I don't know if that answered your question, bro. <laughs> I, I want to say something about the motivation part. Um, motivation, it's, it's, it's something that brings passion. Um, and, I, and I can say, you know, I'm going to take the example of Norman that I, I, I greatly admire. Um, when you're hearing his story, um, it's, it's, it shows his passion and people can feel the passion and people will want to work with him. And I'm saying this because I see a lot of people, they are passionate about something and they are keeping it for themselves. And if you feel you are passionate about something, do something about it because the passion is a thrill that you have in you. Um, and I believe like motivation, it's, it's the greatest, um, it's really connected with passion. It's the greatest like thing that we have in life. And Omara, if, if you guys can allow me to, I can't forget this, okay? I tell this story every time I speak to a group, okay? I have to tell you guys this story, please, okay? It, it's not long, okay? So when I, when I first started building my first school, all right, I, I used to go back and forth, Liberia, Colorado, Liberia, Colorado. And I worked with a very um, small village. Um, they had no school, no running water. And I was very happy that I was placed among them. But what I would do, when I'm leaving back to the States, I will go to the village and I will go back and say goodbye, I'm going back home. But normally I will have a car there, I will have my bag pack and everything so that from the village I go to the airport because the village in the airport is like three hours. And if you miss your flight, you miss your flight. We're talking about miss your flight for a week, <laughs> okay? So you miss your flight, you miss your flight. So I go, so this day, I go to the village and I about to say bye to them. All right. And this little boy, seven years old, Kevin, he held my hand. He kept pulling me. Now, in, in, in the Liberian tradition, it's uncommon for a little boy to hold your hand and keep pulling you. So he kept pulling me. Um, I was kind of nosy, curious to see why he was pulling me. So I took a few steps to see when he was pulling me, he pulled me into like a mud hut and he was pointing at something. And took a, so I took a few steps to see what he was pointing at. He was pointing at his little sister. She was about two to three years old. She was very, very sick. She was pale. She looked very pale. And the little boy, seven years old, figured out that one, I was from America, two, I had a car, he said, in a low subconscious mind, this guy can save my sister. And so me, I was torn between two war. I said to myself, if I take this girl to the hospital, I can miss my flight. And if I miss my flight, I have to stay one home week here. So I said, no, I can't miss my flight. Long story short, I was very selfish. I got on, I got, um, I got on the, I took the car, I got to the airport and flew. The entire time I was on the plane, I was thinking about her. I was thinking about the little girl that could have done something. I got to New York. I called back in the village. She died. She dies. And that day, for me, I started to question myself that who am I, right? I mean, we all face this kind of decision every single day, right? I mean, I could have just stayed one more week and saved this girl's life, but I did not. And I said to myself in that moment, if I ever had the opportunity to change somebody's life, I wouldn't hesitate because in the end, we're all going to die. So why are we here? If we don't live a life of purpose, then why are we here? You know, if life has no purpose, then what's the meaning of life? To die and get old and die? We have to find something bigger than us, you know? Anyway, I should, talk, I should tell you guys that story because 
it, 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 it still reminds me every single day that we all here for a reason and we have to find a way to reach out and lift someone up in a way. That's my little story. Yeah. Thank you so much for that story. Um, we have another question. People are texting me. They're not putting it in the chat. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start their own nonprofit and help people on a larger scale? So the, the biggest advice I would tell people is that um, you have to, running a nonprofit is a very difficult thing um, because there was always issue with money. But I will say to you that with the passion, the passion has to be bigger. It has to be greater, right? You remember me, I drove 100, over 100,000 miles to open a school. So I will say to you, you have to search deep in your heart that you have enough passion, right? Because you might not want to, you might not have the opportunity to start a nonprofit, but you might be able to work with a nonprofit, right? That doing the same thing that you're doing. My, my thing is, Find something to do. Find something. You know, Dr. King said something very profound. Dr. King said, we all cannot be famous, but each of us can be great because greatness is determined by service and all of us can serve. We all can serve. And so to me, you don't have, we all can start a nonprofit, we all can serve. We all can find a group that's already established and we can serve one of them. That would be my, my, my answer to your question. Um, I was reading something somewhere that said about, I think 75% or more of, of people that start nonprofits, they actually fail in the first five years. So to, to uh, add something to what Norman said, if you cannot find it feasible to start something on your own, there's no need to reinvent the wheel for yourself. It takes a lot of work, time, dedication, headache, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. So finding a nonprofit that has the same vision, the same goal, the same purpose, the mission statement that resonates with you, your passion, your desires, there's no reason why you can't call them up um, and pitch your ideas. It could just be another branch of their nonprofit that they could, um, you know, extend um, and, and impact lives as well. So if you can't start your own, you can start with them and eventually, you know, di diverge. Um, so the key to, to starting that would be to converge with a nonprofit that bears the same values and then later on diverge from them into something bigger if that's, if that's your vision still. So that's my advice. I would love to also say that, you know, be prepared for hard time, be prepared, mentally be prepared for hard time. And I think Norman um, has a great story, which is that he built a school and they burn it down. And you know what he did? He built another one. So that's what nonprofit is about. It's don't give up. Do not give up. Wow, thank you so much. We have another question here. What will you say have been your major challenges with integrating into a new culture and your nonprofit profit thus far? I, I think that um, the, the biggest thing that I, I struggle with from the beginning, I, I spent some of my life in Liberia and I spent some of my life in the US. And so every time I go back in, in a village, I try to impose my US beliefs on them. And that has been one of my biggest challenges. And so when I did my, my master in development work, I learned something very fast that you can show up in a village and you can build a clinic and no one will go to that clinic because the people do not want clinic, they want school. You can build a school and no one will show up to that school because the people want a center. The point I'm trying to make is that I learned that if I don't speak to the people, if I don't ask them, if I can partner with them, it would be a biggest challenge. So I tell people, if you're going to work in a disadvantaged area, listen. Listen to them. Don't try to fix them. Partner with them. Let them see you as a partner, like a stakeholder, so that your work can be embraced by them. 
But if you just show up, say, I need to do this, I need to do that. And I, I was born in Liberia. Imagine I was born in Liberia, you know? And, and, and when I go back, I try to impose my, some of my American values on them. It never works. So my biggest challenge is found the balance between what I know here and what I know here and working with them. That would, that would be my, my answer to you. Get found the balance. Yeah. I think also um, culture, it's, it's, it's big, it's, it's, it's diverse, it's, it's I, I, like I can't even really find a good explanation for culture. Um, and me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak from my experience. I'm from Haiti. I live in the U.S. I'm not from Uganda. And I've found myself where like the people I'm working with, their values and my values are different. And again, that's when motivation and passion comes in finding a middle ground to make everything work. Culture, I think, and my hardest one was on punctuality. I'm really punctual, and people in Uganda, it's, it's hard for them to be on time. So it's, it's finding the right balance. Before we wrap up the event, does anyone have any last minute questions for our two great speakers? I do. Um, if someone wants to be a part uh, and join you in your efforts, how do they contact you? Where can we find information? Well, in thehope.org, I will send the information to you. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Ebenezer Norman. Um, you know, you pop in Google, you see me. In. I'm all over the place, you know. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I would, you know, I would love to, Sarah, I would love to work with you. And I'm excited. You got no idea, you know, because I don't, this one more less thing I have to do if I have partner like you or you guys, you know. So, um, yeah, ndhope.org, ndhope.org, yeah. Sanska? Well, for me, it will be on childcarenrescueprogram.org. Um, and also on Facebook, Instagram, you will find us, you can contact us. I'll also send my information to Salwa that she can provide it to you. Um, we are more than happy to work with any of you. The health center is going to be open in April 16th. There is a lot that's going to be going, um, that's going to be done. And a lot of people will be looking forward to seeing anyone who wants to help them, you know, to have a better life. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Norman. <laughs> And Senska and Norman, do you have just a closing statement that you would like to share before we end? Yes, I like to leave you guys with, and Dr. King said, I like to use Dr. King a lot because <laughs> he's one of my favorite heroes, okay? He said that an individual has not started living until he can rise above his narrow confound of his individualistic concern to the broader concern of all mankind. He basically said that unless you can wake up in the morning and think about your neighbors, you know, as yourself. You just exist in our living, you know. And I'm asking you guys that find your one thing, you know. Find that one thing that makes you special. Find that one thing that makes you special and pursue it, you know, that how we change the world. Thank you. Um, for me, it would be, um, there are women out there that are desperate and they don't have any hope. And if you can give those people some hope, you know, do your best and, and give it to them. I remember I asked Essie one time, I'm like, how can you be so wise? Like, you are way younger than me. She was 23 when I met her. So I was just like, how can you be so wise? And she said, because I was, a, um, I was an adult. I started being an adult at 14 years old. Um, and I don't think any child should start being an adult at 14 years old. And, you know, if we can do what we can do, we should try and do it. And I think the same thing with Norman. Try to find your purpose. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, I would just like to share one statement that I learned recently from watching American Idol. Don't judge me. But it was really profound and it touched me so much and I'm, I'm trying to implement it in my own life. I don't, I'm not sure if most of you know, I'm also from Liberia, half of me at least. 
um, and I grew up with Norman in, in a really war-torn country, very poor, um, lost family members. My own personal sister was murdered during the war. So I have a really huge story that could impact lives. Um, however, this is what I learned. Lionel Richie said, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Intrinsically, I'm a really shy person. I don't like crowds and talking too much, but I've learned that coming out of my comfort zone is really where I can make an impact. Even though it just destroys every cell of me to be in crowds, to talk, to express myself, I've learned that over the years, the more I do it, the more I allow myself to feel uncomfortable, the more impact I make on people's lives. So make a daily impact. You may not be able to change the whole, whole world, but in your nursing careers, in your classroom, on the units, on the floor as, a, as a, an ACP, if you touch one life, I've had housekeepers, nutritionists, people that work in the kitchen, just by virtue of how I looked when I used to work as an RN, they would approach me and ask me, how did you get to where you are today? Being a black person working at university hospital, we're like flies in a milk bowl, okay? Really hard to find, but they were inspired just by seeing me, just by being who you are. So never, never feel disappointed by who you are. Believe in yourself, know that you're there for a purpose like they have um, um, talked about today. Grasp that purpose, pull out of your comfort zone. You are making a difference just by virtue of who you are. So that's my word of wisdom for everybody here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone for your time. That concludes our invest event. Um, it's been amazing to hear all these stories and be inspired by what you do. So thank you, Norman. Thank you, Sinska. It's been a great time and we hope to have you back sometime soon. And we will share the information that they provide us to get in touch with the work that they're doing. So everyone have a great day. Thank you.